So this chapter, another chapter from this explains everything. It's the second one that we're reading today. The first one, I think you should go back for it. Well, no, I guess you don't have to. Is Rushkoff's The Procession of the Simulacra. Okay. Now we're doing Stephen M. Koslin's Implications of Ivan Pavlov's Great Discovery. Stephen M. Koslin is a psychologist, the director at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavior Sciences at Stanford University. He wrote this with, oh, sorry, there's two authors. So the other author is uh, Robin Rosenberg's, Rosenberg. Uh, she's a clinical psychologist and author of What's the Matter with Batman? It's easy to imagine a politician's objecting to federal funds going to study how dogs drool. But failing to support such research would have been very short-sighted indeed. As part of his Nobel Prize winning research on digestion, the great Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov, 1849 and 1936, measured the amount of saliva produced when dogs were given food. In the course of this work, he and his colleagues noticed something unexpected. The dogs began salivating well before they were fed. In fact, they salivated when they first heard the approaching footsteps of the person coming to feed them. That core observation led to the discovery of classical conditioning. The key idea behind classical conditioning is that a neutral stimulus, such as the sound of approaching footsteps, comes to be associated with a stimulus, such as food, that reflexively produces a response, such as salvation. And after a while, the neutral stimulus elicits the response produced reflexively by the paired stimulus. To be clear about the phenomenon, we'll need to take a few words to explain the jargon. The neutral stimulus becomes conditioned and hence is known as the conditioned stimulus, CS. Whereas the stimulus that reflexively produces the response is known as the unconditioned stimulus, UCS. And the response produced by the UCS is called the unconditioned response, UR. Classical conditioning occurs when the CS is presented right before a UCS, so that after a while, the CS by itself produces the response. Good boy. When this occurs, the response is called a conditioned response, CR. In short, at the outset, a UCS, such as food, produces a UCR, such as salivation. When a CS, the sound of the feeder's footsteps, is presented before the UCS, it soon comes to produce the response, a CR, salivation, by itself. This simple process gives rise to a host of elegant and non-intuitive explanations. For example, consider accidental deaths from drug overdoses. In general, narcotics users tend to take the drug in a specific setting, such as their bathroom. The setting initially is a neutral stimulus, but after someone takes narcotics in it a few times, the bathroom comes to function as a CS, condition stimulus. As soon as the user enters the bathroom with narcotics, the user's body responds to the setting by preparing for the ingestion of the drug. Specific physiological reactions allow the body to cope with the drug, and those reactions become conditioned to the bathroom. In other words, the reactions become a CR. To get a sufficient high, the user must now take enough of the narcotic to overcome the body's preparation. But... If the user takes the drug in a different setting, perhaps in a friend's bathroom during a party, the CR does not occur. That is, the usual physiological preparation for the narcotic does not take place. Thus, the usual amount of the drug functions as if it were a larger dose and may be more than the user can tolerate without the body's preemptive readiness. Hence, although the process of classical conditioning was formulated to explain very different phenomena, it can be extended to explain why drug overdoses sometimes accidentally occur when usual doses are taken 
in new settings. By the same token, classical conditioning plays a role in the placebo effect. The analgesics regularly used by many of us, such as ibuprofen or aspirin, doliprin, begin to take effect well before their active ingredients have time to kick in. Why? From previous experience, the mere act of taking that particular pill has become a CS, which triggers the pain relieving processes involved by the medicine itself. And those processes have become a CR. Classical conditioning also can result from an implanted defibrillator or pacemaker. When the heart beats too quickly, this device shocks it, causing it to revert to beating at a normal rate. Until the shock level is properly calibrated, the shock can be very uncomfortable and function as a UCS, producing fear as a UCR. Because the shock does not occur in a consistent environment, the person associates random aspects of the environment with it, which then function as CSs. And when any of those environmental aspects are present, the person can experience severe anxiety, awaiting the possible shock. This same process explains why you find a particular food unappealing once it's given you food poisoning. It can thus come to function as a CS, and if you eat it, or even think about eating it, you may feel queasy, a CR. You may find yourself avoiding that food, and thus a food aversion is born. In fact, simply pairing pictures of particular types of food, such as french fries, with aversive photographs, such as a horribly burned body, can change how appealing you find that food. Thus, Pablo's discovery of anticipatory salivation can be easily extended to a wide range of phenomena. But that said, we should point out that his original conception of classical conditioning was not quite right. He thought that sensory input was directly connected to specific responses, leading the stimuli to produce the response automatically. We now know that the connection is not so direct. Classical conditioning involves many cognitive processes, such as attention and those underlying interpretation and understanding. In fact, classical conditioning is a form of implicit learning. As such, it allows us to navigate through life with less cognitive effort and stress than would otherwise be required. Nevertheless, this sort of conditioning has byproducts that can be powerful, surprising, and even dangerous. All right, so if you watched the end of my last video, I'll just leave it at that. Because uh, that's, because yes, that's exactly, you know, what we were saying is that the brain is simple, tries to keep it simple. And so, Hell yeah, bro. If, uh, if we, if there's like, if we see a coincidence of two acts, or a co-occurrence, a recurring, a co-reoccurrence, um, then, oh, okay, then I'll just respond, the way I respond to this thing, since this thing often happens with it, I'll just respond to that thing the same way. So at the end of the last video, I was saying that um, specifically, there are sort of uh, indicators of moral transgression. And when I say indicators, they're treated as indicators kind of in the mind, or even worse, they're treated as full-on transgressions. But what they actually are, are just maybe like a pattern of behavior that we often associate for whatever reason, that can be media, or that can be our, you know, the programming from uh, genetics, whatever. Um, you know, eye contact, for instance, um, we judge someone's sort of morality or character based on their eye contact. Um, and that's because typically with deceit, your eye contact's going to be off. Um, and so the brain learned, okay, I eye contact being off marker of like deceit. Uh, so therefore, the same way that I respond to deceit, which is, oh, no bueno, this person, well, I'm going to respond that same way to uh, this thing that I often, that I associate with deceit, which is eye contact being off.